This lesson is about the art of converting positions like this. As you can see, the, the white pieces have an isolated, well, two isolated pawns. And while we know it has to be better for black, well, many times we simply cannot convert. I'm going to show you the entire game for you to see the, the transition from opening to middle game to end game. You're going to see how a strong player like Grau converted this, but also you're going to hear someone more around your level explain my insights what would i do in the different critical moments if i were playing this in a tournament game right so let's get to it and in the game we start with knight f3 knight f6 and quickly we get into queen's gambit territory after e6 knight c3 knight b to d7 the black pieces the white pieces are attacking our pawn twice we're defending it twice as well nothing to worry about and then after bishop g5 bishop to before we get into the manhattan variation i know this variation as a delicate variation if the white pieces are not careful if their technique is not where it needs to be then they could get into technical difficulties if you will now after e3 we have pawn to c5 and this is the first moment where i really wanted to make a a pause right from this tension that we have in the center, different position types, different pawn structures can happen. And then depending on what we get, uh, we have to adopt the right plan. For example, let's say the white pieces simply take on the five and we take back and then they take again. This is going to leave us with an isolated pawn. We already, we've had a lesson on how to play with the isolated pawn. We've had a lesson on how to play against it. So you just have to be aware of it. Also, let's say we played something, just some random moves, right? Just to show you. And we get to this pawn structure. Well, this is going to be what we know as hanging pawns. The same thing. You have to know what to do if you have them. You have to know what to do if you're playing against them. Of course, we've covered all of it in this channel. But in the game, after pawn to c5, the white pieces simply, simply played knight to d2. And then after queen a5, you can see how the black pieces are taking the initiative we're putting a lot of pressure down this diagonal we continue to have this tension in the center so many different things could happen but one thing is for certain the black pieces are ready to castle and they are the ones putting pressure right now after all of this pressure on the c3 knight we have queen to c2 and the black pieces simply castled so they're basically saying fine my king is in safety now i'm ready to put pressure on white's territory. So after knight to b3, attacking the queen, queen goes to a4, there is a pin on this knight, and there is a pin on the other knight as well. So very interesting move. And after uh, bishop takes f6, I'm not even going to ask you because I assume at this point in the course, we know we have to take with the knight. You don't want to ruin your pawn structure. You don't want to expose your king. So knight takes on f6, maintaining a healthy pawn structure. And then after c takes d5, the black pieces played, c takes d4, and they're ready to collect on d5. Now, all we're looking for as black is to ruin our opponent's pawn structure. For example, if they took with the pawn, that's going to be already an isolated pawn, right? So you can take on d5, you got the knight where it belongs, right in front of the isolated pawn, and you're putting pressure on c3 as well. Of course, in the game, the white pieces could have also taken d take uh, d take c5. Now, not a big deal for us. We can always take on c4 right away, or there's this very interesting line where the black pieces play pawn to b6. And this goes to show not only how tricky this variation could be, the Manhattan variation, but it also reinforces this idea that if you castle quickly, you should try to get to your opponent's king. They haven't developed as quickly. Notice how they cannot really castle right away. The bishop is still behind. So if you develop quickly, you want to get to them as, as quickly as possible, right? So if, let's say, they go and take the pawn, what we're going to do is we're going to go d takes e4 hitting the knight bishop takes bishop b7 hitting the pawn on g2 and even if they castle quickly to defend now 
you can see that we have queen to c6, battery to, de to deliver checkmate, and of course, we're also hitting the bishop. Now, this specific tactic is available in this position, but in general, whenever you get ahead in development, you should try to open up the position, get to your opponent's king, attack, because again, they're not going to castle that quickly, right? That was just to show you if they took on c5. Again, in the game, we have c takes d5, c takes d4, knight takes d4, and after queen c2, knight c2, bishop c3, pawn takes c3, knight d5, we get to this position where our opponent has an inferior pawn structure. But I really wanted to make a point. A lot of people do not pay attention to this because they're playing at a level where their opponents are still blundering pieces, missing uh, missing checkmates, so they never get to need to re rely on this technique. But as you move up the ladder, your opponents don't make silly mistakes anymore. Well, you need this in order to convert your games. Otherwise, you're going to hit a plateau and then you're, gonna, you're not going to know why. And again, many times this is the answer, improving your strategy, your positional, your positional chess. So anyways, after knight d5, we got pawn to c4, and now the question is, how do we continue from here? How many times have I been in this situation? I know that I'm better, but then I end up blowing it, I just get a draw or I lose because I didn't know what to look for. Well, first things first, I have to move the knight, I need to go to safety. The question is, where do I go? Now, one thing that I've I know, I've learned many years ago, is that knights belong in front of the isolated pawn. So this pawn is isolated. I would like to have my knight on c5. So that's one thing for me to look for. Knight c7 makes sense. Knight a6, knight c5, that could be one of the routes. However, Grout decided to go knight to c3. A little bit risky, but if you calculate, you should see it's okay, it's safe. And the point is not only to potentially come, ar come around to get in front of the pawn, but for now, I'm making it difficult for my opponent to improve their pieces. Rook b1 is not possible. Rook d1 is not possible. Even bishop e2, they have to be careful. I don't think they want to drop the bishop, right? So knight c3 makes a lot of sense. And that explains the next move for Sturk. He went knight to a3, trying to get rid of of our annoying knight. So bishop d7, developing our pieces quickly. This is very important. Whenever I'm playing my games, I get to a position like this. I know that I'm better. I also know I'm not going to win in the next five moves or 10 moves. So I need to be careful. And one question I ask myself all the time is, number one, which of my pieces can I improve? But also another question that I ask myself is, how could I lose this game? How could I get in trouble? And of course, the answer to me is if I remain behind in development, if I don't activate my pieces quickly. So bishop d7 simply makes sense. Very natural move. Knight to b1, challenging knight. And now the question to you is, would you capture that knight? Would you trade or would you move away? Well, in the game, we have knight to a4, and I hope it made sense to you not to trade because now if you compare this where they have the active rook, my knight is not bothering them anymore. If you compare this position to knight a4 where we still have the annoying knight, I mean annoying for our opponent, they have this lack of development because the knight went back to their ho its home square. Well, I think we have to like this better, right? So after knight a4, we got bishop e2, bishop c6. Finally, my bishop is improved and then the white pieces castled. Now, from this moment on, the same thing. Keep it simple, just put their pieces where they belong. This rook is gonna go to the eight because the other rook goes to the other semi-open file that we have, which is the C file. So after rook f to the eight, the white pieces claim the file, we trade, and then knight goes to b2. I gotta tell you, this move doesn't come that natural to me. I'll be a little bit concern about my knight but Grau explains how he liked the idea of keeping the initiative he wanted to put pressure he wanted to make them uncomfortable before they could quickly develop and coordinate i think i would have personally played rook to the eight but now you see why knight b2 was played so after knight b2 bishop b2 
rook d8 king goes to f1 and of course the black pieces are also activating the king it's time is the end game no one is going to checkmate us they don't have the queens they don't have a lot of pieces so it's safe to get the king out pawn to g3 white is ready to continue to centralize the king but they don't want to lose the pawn interesting how f3 is a possibility as well but i don't think they want to leave e3 weak and not only the pawn but even if they advance further the e3 square might be um, might be a problem for them and i could i can even think of my king penetrating later in the end game via the dark squares or my knight get into e3 and so on so g3 was played instead don't forget every time every time we move a pawn in chess weaknesses are created in this case the f3 square becomes available and you can see how you will see how this is key in the game so after king e7 knight a3 knight a4 knight a4 very interesting move we're ready to get in front of the knight but we're also threatening to go to b2 i mean to d2 and then to b2 if necessary king e1 preventing us from getting to d2 and then the knight goes to c5 now i think this is my favorite part of the game in the game Grau or after the game Grau was explaining how he thought of it like okay my knight already did what he had to do on the queen side make my opponent's pieces uncomfortable unable to coordinate themselves easily but now the knight is going to go to the king side to create new weaknesses or to simply accentuate new weaknesses so you can see how the knight goes to a4 then to c5 then a6 simply keeping this knight at margin and then knight goes to e4 tempo and then knight to g5 just to get to f3 now what are they looking for with this maneuver well after knight b1 knight f3 check hitting the king and the pawn you can see how they had to trade their bishop for our knight if you already went over lesson number i want to say 74 you know how in a position like this the bishop has to be better but also we know how in general this combination of bishop and rook is better than uh, knight and rook so these little things is what help us convert our games we go from having a better position because of the pawn structure to converting that into something something a little bit bigger which is now bad pawn structure plus we have the bishop versus the knight and then we got to convert that into something bigger and so on so after bishop f3 we got rook to d2 and then another critical moment would you simplify or not well i have to tell you i personally i would be very very attracted to this idea of simplifying the game i always tell you if i'm a heavy material i simplify the game if i have a better pawn structure i like the idea of simplifying the game particularly here because i also have the better minor piece right bishop versus the knight however Grau decided he needed the rook to put pressure on the weak pawn. He wanted to keep more pieces so that it was easier to target that pawn. And then after rook c2, you can see bishop e4, x clam. And then after rook c1, bishop to d5. There's a pin, and you can see a lot of pressure already on that c4 pawn. I think this bishop e4 is so important because if we go here, they could play knight a3, not only defending, but also supporting the rook, and they're ready to take, right? So if we make the rook go away, now if knight a3 is played, well, they're not defending the rook, right? So bishop d5, knight to d2, and then finally we got pawn to b5. So putting a lot of pressure on the weak pawn, and yes, it's true that we allowed them to advance the pawn, and that pawn becomes a passed pawn but number one this is going to be for us number two even if, if this pawn is here and it's safe now don't forget it is an isolated pawn it is a passed pawn but it's isolated meaning it cannot be defended by another pawn we just need to block it target it and the pawn should fall sooner or later in the game grau took on a2 and then after rook a6 well we take on c5 and you can see how we went from having a better pawn structure to having the better pawn structure and the better minor piece to finally being up by a pawn that's what it comes down to small improvements now after uh, rook a7 king f6 we keep activating the king e4 check 
bishop c4 and then rook to c4. I have to tell you, this endgame is very drawish. We're up a pawn, but rook endgames are very, very tricky. Just like I tell you this, I tell you something that I tell my students all the time. Don't feel that just because you have an even position, the game is going to be a draw. From this position, there, there's a lot of chess to be played. At least another 20, 30, 40 moves, and a lot of mistakes could be made. If you're playing at the elite level, that's a different story. But the rest of us, we're going to make mistakes here left and right. So the best thing we can do is keep the pressure, let your opponent, allow your opponent to make mistakes, and enjoy it. If they play really well and they draw the game, congrats. But it's, uh, it's not that easy, right? So that's something to keep in mind. In the game, we have pawn to e5. White is trying to get us to collect the pawn and then they chop off everything on the seventh rank. So of course not. King goes to g6, king f3, h5, rook b7, rook c3 check, and then we go for the seventh rank as well. So we're basically telling them, get our isolated pawn, which is passed, but it's isolated, and let me collect these two pawns, right? Of course, white pieces are saying, not tonight. Rook in f3, rook b2, h4. We're going to advance the pawn, try to push him as much as we can, and then try to either bring the king over to help or try to use our rook or a, a check to get the rook from in front of the pawn, right? Well, after pawn to b4, the white pieces made the mistake, the mistake that costed them the game. They played pawn to g4. And just like that, this position went from being roughly equal to being plus four for the black pieces. So after pawn takes, pawn, uh, king takes, rook f2, the, uh, the, the black pieces should be winning this endgame. The main reason is we get an extra pawn, but the white pieces have, the, the two pawns they have are isolated. They're just too weak. We have had many, 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 many videos on rook endgames on this channel. I always tell you, I've never read an entire endgame book, but I know my king and pawn endgames, and I know my rook endgames. Not perfectly, but I know the main ideas, the main principles. And uh, I know that three connected pawns are just too much. Of course, we'll still have to collect these guys, but with patience and the right technique, they should fall. After rook before, we got rook to e2 already putting pressure on the weak pawn rook b5 check we go back again patience one of those pawns has to fall sooner or later and the king is ready to go in and help so after rook b4 king f5 give me the pawn they come back trying to collect something as well well the black pieces was happy to were happy to collect on e5 because now this is not even possible or they get skewered. So after a few more moves, the, the white pieces simply had nothing else to do. After rook f4, they resigned. Keep in mind, if they had taken here, we could just go check, forcing them to trade with transition from rook endgame into a very easy to win king and pawn endgames. Outside pass pawn, now it's a different story. It's isolated, but uh, it's not a rook endgame. It is a king end game again this is not as exciting as reviewing those great uh, games where there are sacrifices and crazy tactics it's a little bit more boring but it is just as important so like always let me know in the comments if you had any questions i'll be happy to address it in our next video and let me know if you like if you'd like to see more lessons like this one with that said be safe and i'll see you next time